Hello. It it has been quite a while since I've regularly been posting stuff on the website, on the YouTubes, on the podcast. There's just been a lot going on, and I really haven't had a whole lot of free time. Now, I'm excited because what I decided I'm going to do is just basically start recording lectures that I give online uh, and in person to the residency I'm involved with, as well as conferences and stuff. And I'm going to share it with you all and try to be a little bit more consistent uh, with the free open access medical education content. And I'm so happy to share with you. Now, this lecture that I'm going to talk about today is about something that is, I don't know, I, I just feel like there's a niche for it. And it's it's kind of like a jigsaw, right? So it's a saw that I have that I've used twice since I bought it back in med school. So it was, you know, a while ago, I'm say a while ago. And this jigsaw I actually have only used twice, but the two times that I've used it, it's it's been like the only and best tool for that specific application. That's what I think about airway ultrasound. Now I'm not using airway ultrasound on every single patient that I'm thinking about either intubating or doing an invasive procedure like a cricothyrotomy, but I'm aware of how to do it. I've definitely done it a couple of times. And as far as indications and when to use it, that's something that I actually talk about in the lecture. So without further ado, check out the airway ultrasound lecture that originally was recorded for WinFocus this past year, 2022. Check it out. Hello, my name is Jay Avila, and in this video lecture, I'm gonna walk you through some salient important parts of airway ultrasound. Now, as far as disclosures, I work for Butterfly and I have a website called Core Ultrasound. We have mostly free stuff, but there's some paid content on there as well. Let's go through our objectives. They're pretty simple. Firstly, we're gonna talk about endotracheal versus esophageal intubation and how ultrasound can be beneficial for that. And then we're gonna talk about how to differentiate between tracheal versus bronchial intubation. Basically, is your ET tube in the correct location or not? Let's talk a little bit about equipment. Your probes you're gonna to wanna to use are the linear or the curvilinear transducer. Both work well. I will tell you that most of the time, I'm gonna actually be using the curvilinear transducer. And the reason for that is a curvilinear transducer gives me a wider window that I'm gonna look through. And the fact that the lower frequency means that I have a lower resolution image, honestly, doesn't matter all that much when you're looking at tracheal ultrasound because really what you're doing is basically looking for movement. And even if the frequency is a bit lower, the movement is really what you're looking for. So I will sacrifice some of that image resolution for a wider field of view, especially in my patients that are a little more on the fluffy side. Additionally, make sure that when you are using your tracheal ultrasound for intubation, you also have a rag that you can make sure to wipe off the gel just in case you need to have any external manipulation of that airway. Now, with regards to actual placement of that transducer on the neck, you're going to place it either in the suprasternal notch or just lateral to the suprasternal notch. Now, most of the studies actually place it in the suprasternal notch, but personally, I like actually finding the esophagus as kind of my primary landmark, because that's what you're trying to make sure that the tube is not going into. And normally that's gonna be on the left side of the neck, but sometimes it's on the right side of the neck. So right here we have the trachea, and right there we have the esophagus. Now, looking at this, there's a couple of landmarks. Now, this is the curvilinear transducer, and right here we're seeing essentially a hyperechoic kind of arch right here, which represents the anterior part of the trachea, and then we're seeing this dropout of shadow, this acoustic shadowing right here that happens deep to the trachea due to the air in the trachea. And then right here, we're seeing a circular structure that has relatively well-defined walls right here. And this represents the esophagus. We have some vasculature here and right over here, we're having some more blood vessels. We have thyroid, we have thyroid, but the thing that we're looking at is trachea and esophagus. This is the resolution of a linear transducer. So you can see here, it looks a lot more crisp using that linear transducer. And if you have somebody in which this looks better and you're able to see both the trachea and the esophagus, 
go for it. But as you can see, the width of the transducer, if there's any big movements, I'm gonna have to shift my transducer left or right to follow that esophagus right there. And because of that, I typically will use the curvilinear transducer because of that, again, wider field of view. Okay, now that we've reviewed what a normal looks like and what the trachea looks like and what the esophagus looks like on ultrasound, let's focus in on exactly what we're looking at when things are going wrong. Namely, how to identify an esophageal intubation, which most of the time, that's not what we want. We want a tracheal intubation. Now, the appearance of a sonographic esophageal intubation, we're basically looking for a sign that these two things are like the same thing. You either look for a double trachea, so it looks like there are two tracheas rather than a trachea and esophagus, or you can look for a second air mucosal surface and see if that thing is the thing that's being manipulated with that ultrasound. Let me show you what I mean. So right here, we have a linear transducer. We have the trachea here. We can see the compressed esophagus right here. And here we're seeing a little bit of manipulation there in the esophagus and boom, we have two tracheas, one trachea, two tracheas. That is not good. Seeing two tracheas in the neck means that the patient has two circular air filled rigid structures. And one of those is the endotracheal tube in the esophagus and the other one is the trachea. So what you want to see instead is you want this to stay nice and flat, this esophagus, and you want to see this trachea basically have movement, have manipulation in it, and then you'll see a change in the type of air artifact that you see due to the plastic of the ET tube. So here we're starting to see a little movement in there, and then boom, we're seeing the esophagus staying as the esophagus down here, and we're seeing some manipulation, some movement of that trachea, and a slight change of the air artifact that we're seeing in there, which confirms a dynamic tracheal intubation dynamic, meaning you have the ultrasound in there as the procedure is taking place. Let me show you what an esophageal intubation looks like on ultrasound and what a tracheal intubation on ultrasound looks like. This was a scenario where we had an early trainee and they were using just DL while I was looking at VL and had somebody else look at the ultrasound. You can see down there, we're seeing a change in the esophagus here manipulation, which we don't wanna see. And then when we redirect, we're able to actually see change in the trachea right there with no change in the esophagus down here. So this is a tracheal intubation. And right here, we're seeing an esophageal intubation. This is bad, and this is good. Now, I know I went through that a little fast, so let's watch that whole thing over again. So we already see that there is a OG tube in, which helps us know that that's actually the esophagus down there. We're seeing a change in the air mucosal interface of the esophagus indicating an esophageal intubation. And then when we redirect and actually put it through those cords, we're able to see it here in the trachea, which is what we want to see. Now, the more you start using airway ultrasound, the more you realize that the applications are pretty broad. There's a lot of things that you can do. Now this right here, this is by now hopefully a familiar view. We have our trachea over here with our bit of A lines and some shadowing deep to that. And over here, we're seeing a nice and compressed esophagus. This is actually the inner lumen right here and here are the wall of the esophagus with some um, muscle and muscle and uh, probably some thyroid out there. Now what we can do is we can actually use the bougie to identify even before we do the intubation. So you see how we have here some little almost like tickling of the more superficial part of that trachea right there. That is the gum elastic bougie with a little end pointed up and I'm pushing it up and down the trachea and I'm feeling those tracheal rings, but it's nice to have this extra confirmation of that bougie actually being in the trachea and not in the esophagus where we don't want it. And then of course, after we have a confirmation that the bougie is in the trachea, we just slide that ET tube in and we are good to go. Now, there is something that is fairly important to understand with regards to just the practicality of doing this on an actual patient is that, well, it's a great idea. And I'd actually recommend doing a survey scan before the intubation just to know exactly where the trachea is, where the best window is, and to be able to identify exactly where that esophagus sits. 
in the neck. Um, usually it's in the left, like I mentioned before, but sometimes it's on the right. And sometimes, honestly, it's directly behind the trachea, which is one of the reasons why I like looking at it laterally, because if I'm looking at it laterally and the esophagus happens to be deep or posterior to that trachea, if I place the probe laterally, I'll still be able to see the esophagus deep to the trachea because on that view, if I have my probe laterally, they're actually a little more side by side. So the air artifact from the trachea doesn't actually obscure that esophagus. Now, that being said, you've already done your survey scan. You actually want to put the probe down and let the intubator place the laryngoscope actually in the mouth. Now, this is actually an important component is that to do this dynamically, it actually is a two-person examination. Now, if you happen to have three hands sick, you can do it all on your own. But with us two-handed people, we can only have the endotracheal tube in our right hand and the uh, laryngoscope in our left hand. We actually need a second operator to do the actual scanning of the neck. Now, here's why it doesn't work. So if you have the probe on the neck and you try to stick that laryngoscope in, you can see here, it just, it gets in the way and you definitely do not want to get in the way of that laryngoscope. So go ahead and have your intubator put the laryngoscope in and then place the probe after that so it doesn't get in the way. Now, I did mention it before, but one thing you have to make sure is have a towel in your hand to make sure that if there needs to be some kind of external manipulation of that airway, that you're able to take the gel off and then be able to actually get some traction on the neck as you're manipulating that airway externally. It's the same thing as when you are doing a cardiac arrest ultrasound. When you're doing uh, evaluation of the heart sonographically, during pulse checks, I always recommend having a towel ready to go to wipe off the gel so that anybody doing compressions can still do compressions without sliding off the chest. All of the previous examples assume that you have two operators. That's one that can look with the ultrasound and the other that does the intubation. And well, that often is something that can happen depending on the support that you have at your institution. You might be working in a place where it's maybe just you and an RT and a nurse and the RT and the nurse are busy doing other stuff and it's just you with the airway. So what you can do is you can just go ahead and look before that intubation and then place the ultrasound transducer down. And then if you're not sure, put the ultrasound transducer back. And if you see that double trachea sign as a more, I guess, static approach, so not during the actual procedure itself, you can actually look afterwards and see if you have two tracheas here, then you're in the esophagus. And if you have intubated and you only see one trachea and you see a collapsed esophagus, which is probably, uh, I don't know on this one exactly where it's at, but I'm assuming right there, then you are good. So this is good. This is bad. All right. So we have now discussed how to identify an endotracheal versus an esophageal intubation for the next section. We're going to discuss tracheal versus bronchial intubation. I'm going to take a brief pause here just to let you know that all of our content is on the coreultrasound.com website. That is Ultrasound Podcast, 5 Minutes Sono, Ultrasound of the Week, Clip Bank, and we also have our courses page where we have the Core Ultrasound Fundamentals and Core Ultrasound Question Bank where you have 3,200 questions with feedback including narrated videos explaining the question. Check it out and back to your video. Now, what I'm talking about here is being able to identify exactly how deep you are in the patient's airway. Let's say that you get into trachea, it's all good, but if you happen to main stem it and you're unable to identify that early, you can actually cause some pretty significant harm. You can cause a pneumothorax. You can cause some pre-severe atelectasis. There are bad things that can happen. And using your ultrasound that you already have used to make sure that you're in the trachea is not a bad idea. In fact, it is a good idea. There are a couple of different methods that you can utilize. And really where it comes down to is being able to identify where that balloon is on the end of the ET tube. And you can do that a couple of different ways. Now, this is the way that I prefer. There are other methods to utilize, and I'm gonna talk about the non-tracheal ways a little bit later. But for now, let's focus in on the tracheal methods. 
Now, one thing you can do is you place the transducer in the suprasternal notch and you identify what you think is the balloon or the area where the balloon should lie. And the balloon itself should actually lie right at the suprasternal notch. That is with the balloon being just underneath the cord. So that's actually where you want it. And if you place it there and you inflate the balloon under real time guidance and you see this, a fl almost like a flexing and relaxing of the lateral width of that trachea, then you know that that is the balloon because that's what inflates when you inflate the balloon, right? So this is a pretty easy way just using that air. Another thing you can do is this. This is actually probably my favorite way that you can do this. And it is feeling the cuff with saline itself to be able to actually see all the way around. Because remember when you fill it with fluid, suddenly you'll be able to see all the way through it. Whereas if it's just with air, all you're gonna see is that subtle widening of that trachea. This way you can actually find the balloon and if you can find it in that suprasternal notch, it is in the correct location. Now, I have heard some concerns about the fact that sailing is much less compressible when compared with air. So longer period of time that someone is intubated might actually cause some increased risk of trauma to that area. Uh, and it may lead to like things like stenosis and tracheal injuries and stuff. But from what I understand in the literature, anesthesiologists do this fairly frequently, especially when doing ENT surgeries. Additionally, after you confirm this with saline, you can always just deflate it and then put air back into it. So you can just use the saline to confirm the location, you know, make sure that you connect it to the cuff collar, take the saline out, and then refill it with air. Now, most of the studies here talk about placing a transducer transversely over the trachea, but another thing you can do, which is also fun, is actually placing it in the sagittal orientation or more longitudinally. And if you see the cuff in the upper part of that footprint, then you need to advance the cuff more deep. And then if you don't see the cuff at all, then you're definitely too deep and you just back it up a little bit. So this is what that would look like. So right here, we have the air in the trachea. We have some tracheal rings here and here. And I have the probe longitudinally and the bottom part of the probe or the part away from the probe marker. This right here is actually resting in the suprasternal notch. So what you wanna see is you want to see that endotracheal tube filled with saline to actually inflate on this side, not anywhere other than on the extreme right side of that image that you're getting. So here we can see kind of fanning through and I'm having somebody inflate the cuff with saline and you can see, boom, we are seeing that cuff right here, right in the exact spot that we're looking at, which confirms that the balloon is directly underneath the cords, meaning it is in the appropriate place in that specific patient. Now, this was tracheal methods of correct endotracheal tube placement in the trachea versus one of the mainstem bronchi. You can also do this. You can also look for diaphragmatic movement bilaterally. And if it is essentially equivalent, this movement of the diaphragm right here as you're ventilating the patient, if these movements are equal bilaterally, then you're probably in a good spot. It's the equivalent of, of listening for breath sounds. And the other thing you can do is just look for lung sliding. And you're not looking for like necessarily the presence and absence of lung sliding. What you're looking for is a similar amount of lung sliding because you want to make sure that both of the lungs are being ventilated the same, meaning the ET tube is actually in the trachea, not in one of the main stem bronchi. Now, here is the main question. Why would you do this if you are amazing at intubating, you have VL, or you have entitled CO2, the regular stuff, right? That is a good question. For me, the main reason I'm doing this is I might have residents that actually really want to do direct laryngoscopy, and I don't necessarily like know how good they are, or conversely, I know that they you know, aren't the best intubators, which is good, that they want to get better at it, right? So if I have myself using the ultrasound to make sure that they are in the trachea when they say they are, that makes me feel better and it's better outcomes for the patient. So that's probably the main reason I'm using it. But practically speaking, there are other times where the video laryngoscopy and direct will fail you. And the big one here that I'm thinking about is massive GI bleeds. 
this can really obscure your airway. And even with video laryngoscopy, it is very difficult to see exactly what you're doing. And of course, our equipment can fail us, right? You can have situations where you have a trusty video laryngoscopy, but it fails because it's equipment. And so these are all situations where it would be nice to have that ultrasound in your back pocket. Now, I'm definitely not saying you need to use ultrasound every single time or that if if you don't use ultrasound, you're doing something bad. That is not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is with the appropriate scenario, the ultrasound of the neck during intubation can really save your bacon. Now, with regards to accuracy of this, when compared to the gold standard of capnography, there are a few meta-analyses out there that actually show really good numbers, sensitivities and specificities in the high 90s, very nearly 100% sensitive and specific. There are a lot of other things that we could talk about with regards to uh, airway ultrasound, but for this, we're just gonna focus in on endotracheal intubation. Hopefully that was helpful for you all. Again, not something I'm doing on every single patient, but in the select patient in which it is indicated, I think massively beneficial. Don't forget to check out our website, coreultrasound.com. You can actually go to courses.coreultrasound.com. We have courses on there, great for residencies, nursing programs. We also have a question bank on there that you can access 3,200 narrated questions and answers. And we don't concentrate on a whole lot of like patient scenarios because we assume that you have that already. This is basically to show you an image, a clip, and we want you to be able to look at that clip and say, this is right heart enlargement or not. This is cellulitis or not. This is a pneumothorax or not. So check back frequently on the YouTube page, the uh, website and the other kind of social media stuff that we have for new free content coming to you soon. Hope to hear from you soon and happy scanning.